It would be my pleasure to announce uh, or to introduce to you again, Chris McGee is back. Um, he teaches at University of Lynchburg, so he's made the trip this morning to help us really celebrate uh, Palm Sunday. So thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'd like to he thank Helen Burkett. She just couldn't stand it anymore, and she's brought some flowers to place on our altar to make it an appropriate Holy Week and a, um, today's service. We thank you for doing that, Helen. A lot of stuff going on this week, starting with today's service. Thank you for being here. Uh, we, during the week, you can bring flowers and decorate the cross outside. And you might have noticed as you came into the sanctuary, there are palm fronds at the front door and the side exits. So if you would like to, you can pick one up and start the decorating by taking one and putting it in the cross as you leave today. And that may get the process started. A lot of people in our community last year participated as they drove by and saw that the cross needed flowering. And you, I think you saw the slide go across the screen of how beautiful it turned out last year. And a lot of people appreciated it in our community. There's an Easter egg hunt for our children this afternoon from 3.30 to 5 p.m. So tell your friends about that. That will happen even if it is raining because uh, this is a whole new one for me in my lifetime. There will be a drive through Easter egg hunt. So be careful that you don't run your cars over the Easter eggs. But that's through the portico downstairs. And so everything's ready. Ginger's raring and ready to go. If you have questions, she's at the back door back there. Our Monday, Thursday, uh, and Good Friday services will be by uh, virtual over the internet. So please tune into those and uh, enjoy the special devotions that are scheduled for this week. Uh, communion kits have been consecrated and they will be at the side doors as you exit so that you can take them home from Maundy Thursday evening communion during that service that you can get over the internet. So uh, we will be trying to deliver the communion elements to our shut-ins that are between the ages of 60 and 70. We did 70 to 85 last time, so we're working our way through the list. So if you know of somebody that you'd like to make sure gets communion elements, you would be welcome to call the church office and remind us in case we miss anybody. And I'll also say that next Sunday, I think there's a slight possibility that we may bump into the uh, maximum number of seats on Easter Sunday morning, there are two services, 9 and 11. And so uh, if, you're, if you have friends that are planning on coming that haven't been with us yet during the pandemic, if they'd like to call and let us know, it'll, we'll make a list and try to plan to have everybody seated according to the guidelines and keep everybody safe. Did I see you waving over there, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, about communion, the communion kits are available. Uh, that folks can take home and participate. But also, if someone said, well, you know, I, I'd rather use some bread and grape juice at home, if they, will, if they can do that, uh, if they do it along with the video that is provided, uh, they don't have to have a kit, but they, they have the option. They can have the kit or use the bread and juice that they have at home or get this week. Oh, have them prayed over virtually? But well, we will we will consecrate video. via the video. So when they watch the video, it it's a, it's a different time. It's, <laughs> Amen. It's, it's a it's a new stretch for me, but it's it'll work. You see me having trouble keeping up, don't you? So, uh, our clothing closet for the food pantry this month was a big hit. They let them go through and shop a little bit more than they have in the past, and a lot of clothes left here, thankfully, because we were getting overcrowded. But at the same time. There were still some people that were in need of some coats, and we were able to provide those. And JAM is back to, to work on Thursday afternoons from 5.15 to 6 o'clock. And so Ginger had some young people here this week and some participating virtually, and we rejoice that we're able to have children's ministries starting back up. Oh, we got a thank you from Chilhowee Christian Church because some of the vol some volunteers from our church provided lunch for the uh, workers who were providing vaccinations at Chilhowee Christian Church this past week on Tuesday and they wanted to say thank you to you all for providing that lunch so thank you all very much and thanks to the volunteers that like that. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything, a lot going on. Don't forget to look in your pew and see the picture, the sermon, picture sermon possibilities. James has got something to say about that. Well, yes. Uh, 
not a, not a not a lot of responses this past week. You must be doing a good job of picking. Apparently, yeah. apparently, uh, the the genius just exudes. Okay, well. Well, no, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I can I can say that because I I don't I don't really believe that. Um, <laughs> But no, there's, there's. Uh, I just want to encourage you: uh, a topic, a person, um, a subject, a question. Some folks have submitted some very good ones, and and will be part of part of the upcoming series. But if there's something that just you, you're like, gosh, I, I haven't heard a sermon on that. I've wondered about that. Gosh, you never hear a sermon about. And you fill in the blank. Uh, put it on that sheet. Call the church office, send me a Facebook message, send me a text. Uh, I, I really would like to, to hear from you and to receive from you ideas and suggestions uh, as we kind of craft a series that really comes from uh, what folks in the congregation are just have some questions and interest in. And, and a note about Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have nursery for both services. You want to be sure to lift that Thank up. Thank you, yes. It was on my list and I missed it. Thank you for bringing that up because we're excited to have our children back in our nursery area. Now, I think I've covered all that. You all know of other things we should share with everyone? I can say to you this morning that I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, we have the equipment to video stream the service next week. We have wired it in. We can see Jim sitting at the piano. We can see the preacher preaching. Uh, we're, we got to make that plug in from here to the internet. Um, it will be available on YouTube and Facebook. And I don't know the difference between streaming and a farm pond. So there's somebody helping us. And they will, uh, we plan on having it hooked up this week, testing it and sending it through. We're still in need of some volunteers to help us with the media team. We have a person that's operating one camera. We're keeping it very, very simple. We need a person to operate the other camera. So uh, if you'd be interested in helping us, we'd love to have you. And I'd also, for your care, uh, feeling of care, know that the, after the 9 o'clock service next week, the pews will be sanitized between 10 and 11 and allowed to dry. So uh, if you'd be interested in helping with that, please see me and we'll do, make arrangements to have everything you need. Uh, we're being careful to not spray a bunch of aerosols to do that process because we have some people who have been affected by the aerosols that we were spraying in here and trying to keep them in good shape for the next service. So, Dan, uh, yep. the uh, difference between streaming and a farm pond, one has water. I thought both did. All right. As we come to our praises and prayer requests, uh, we would remember Janet Kimball and the, her sister up in Ohio. We continue to pray for a, a colleague of Jimmy Martin's, Jeff Lucas, who in, uh, had a stroke about two weeks ago and is just slightly recuperating. We remember Helen's family and the loss of brother Don Wampler in passing. And then uh, Roseanne Bruzo's father had requested prayer up in New York State. He is improving and is back at home. Uh, James continues to uh, ask us to pray for the family of Linda Finnegan. We prayed for her earlier in the season, but she passed away, and we continue to remember her husband, Reggie Finnegan, in, uh, in our prayers. And we remember Gladys Gray up in Vinton, the mother of Joyce Cullop, that we've been praying for, for quite a uh, Gladys is suffering quite a bit. Roxanne Creasy, I'm happy to tell you, is improving and is at home. And I think Ernie Sands and Tara Sands, we've been praying for her daughter and his brother, and they have gone, I think, to visit them during the Easter holidays. And uh, Brother Breen lifted up Tanner Blanton a couple of weeks ago, and we keep him on our list for prayers. Are there others that you know that should be added to this list? Yes, sir, Mr. Crowder. Alex Rhodes, he lives down in the Tri-City, a pharmacist that grew up here in our community, and he uh, has an uh, episode going on that they're going to try to correct with surgery this coming Thursday. Thank you, sir. Jimmy. Well, I skipped right over that one, didn't I? Baynard Barton. Uh, he 
lives here in town now. He used to be beautiful, but he's a uh, brother of Amy Martin, and we've been praying for him as he prepares for some surgery. Doctors trying to decide what to do. Brother Aiden. Wait a minute. You're going to have to translate for me, Aiden. The victims of the shooting at in Boulder, is that the grocery store one? You'll have to help me. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the number of these things we're having regularly, and I am flabbergasted. But I agree with you, Aiden. We need to remember those people in our prayers. Yes, ma'am. Bill Carrico, okay, in our community here. Okay, I think most of you all know him. All right. Thank you all for participating in that. Once again, I say that's probably one of our most important tasks for Sunday morning. Friends, we come to a time when we uh, share the gifts that God has given us and uh, in gratitude and in joy we, we give. It's, it's a tangible way that we can participate in our discipleship. Uh, we have uh, several means by which we can do that. Uh, the, the sending of a check to the church, you can drop a check by. We have an online option as well as there's a bank draft that you can do with uh, the, your, your bank. 
So you can, or you can, uh, following the service, you can drop um, uh, a check in, in the offering plate or here up on the altar uh, as, as a means of dedication. But we give because God has given much to us. In fact, God has given everything to us. And so we give out of a generous heart, recognizing God has been extremely generous to us. And so it's one way that we can uh, participate in our discipleship. Uh, we focus on our prayers, our service, our time, but we also lift up our giving. So as we prepare to do that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, indeed, as we uh, share in this time of giving, uh, let us give in such a way that we are mindful that you have given us everything. And because of that, uh, we are grateful, a bit awestruck, thankful. And so now as we uh, seek to grow and, and go deeper in our faith, may we give in response. It's in your great and wonderful name we pray and for your sake. Amen. be doing a, a hymn and 
I just can't wait until we can all sing together again. I hope it's soon. Uh, but I'd like to sing for you and have uh, Chris play along on Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. <laughs> journey through Lent and spending time reflecting and taking stock, going through a season of self-examination, and now uh, the drama unfolds of entry into Jerusalem, the most important week in your son's life. So may we walk with him, walk close by, take in, take to heart what happens in this week to receive in the most complete way possible this wonderful miracle, this, this abiding truth that is the resurrection. Let's sing to Jesus, speak his name as King and Lord and Sovereign. And give him praise and glory. For he is the Lord and ruler of us all. We pray in the wonderful name of your son and for his sake. And pray as he taught us our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into evil. Deliver us from evil. In the glory forever. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 21. Verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Most Bibles will title this Jesus' Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem. Doesn't matter the translation, that's what most will title this. 
They had come near Jerusalem and reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you and tied. Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, indeed, May we draw close to you as in this service of worship. Through being here, being connected, through hearing on the radio, through watching later on our computers, we, we are together, we are connected. As different and non-typical as it is, we are together, we are connected. So... Uh, Draw us closer to each other as we seek to draw close to you. In your name and for your sake we pray. Amen. Now we, we started a Lenten series called The Power of the Gospel, looking at the events from the life of Jesus where he displays uh, power, at which point to, lead to, him being understood as... God's Son, the Savior, the one who has come. It's in reflecting on these actions, on these different, account, different accounts in Scripture, that we are preparing ourselves to uh, receive Easter in a very new and different way. We started the series looking at healing, then forgiveness, then resurrection, then fear and trust, then exorcism last Sunday, and now we come to the conclusion of the series, The Power of the Gospel, considering humility. Now, Jesus redefined power with a demonstration of his humility and his humanity. Today we arrive in the season of Lent, we arrive at Palm Sunday. Sometimes kids and congregants will wave palms. And, and I've heard of a church hosting donkey rides in the church parking lot. I knew one pastor one time who had an actual donkey ride down the middle of the church aisle. I'm not so sure about that. Now, and, and later today, we're asking you all, the palm fronds you see at the various exits, take them, put them on the cross out front, so when people drive by, when people walk by, they go, ah, Palm Sunday. So be sure to put your palm frond uh, out there after the service. Such rejoicing, such acts of adoration and praise are appropriate. But we do well to be careful not to miss the real and significant importance of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. 
Ironically, most Bibles title this particular section, uh, especially Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, and all the other Gospels do as well, the triumphal entry. That's what most of them title it. When in fact, Jesus and the Gospel writers who told the story actually depicted it in such a way as to de-emphasize anything having to do with triumphalism. The triumph. A core theme in Matthew is that Matthew presents Jesus as both man, human, and son of David, both servant and Lord, as the humble king and the suffering servant. And in the process of that, in the process of that contrast, Lifting up Jesus' humanity as well as his divinity. The redefinition of power takes place. Matthew makes it clear that Jesus is Lord. Jesus even self-identifies as Lord in verse 3. He makes the same claim by the very manner in which he enters and is greeted as he comes into the city of Jerusalem. In the midst of its holiest and busiest festival, Passover. Indeed, that day, our king was coming to see us, prophesied Zechariah. The people shouting, Hosanna, is a quoting of Psalm 118, identifying Jesus as the son of David. By spreading their cloaks on the ground, they treat him in the same way they treated the entrance of king of Israel back in the day when the monarchy flourished. The palm branches were the equivalent of banners and flags that many of us are so familiar with with, with, with parades and times of celebration. Yet, even in those numerous signs of kingship, Matthew goes to great lengths to emphasize Jesus' humanity and ultimately his humility. Of the donkey and the colt, Jesus speaks of the need. Divinity has need of nothing, but humanity does. The need of a donkey and riding into town on a donkey is from Zechariah 9.9. Your king comes to, to you riding on a donkey. But between the words, behold, your king is coming to you, and the other part of that uh, passage, riding on a donkey, the prophet Zechariah describes the king in this way. He says, righteous, that king is righteous, and having salvation. In fact, a strict translation of that phrase would read, triumphant and victorious is he. So Jesus coming into Jerusalem, he is righteous, and coming into Jerusalem, he is victorious. But that triumphalism, That sense of adoration and, oh, the king comes. That's put aside and abandoned in favor of modesty. The donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem emphasizes, reinforces that message. A horse would have been a far better choice to ride in on for a king coming into a city such as Jerusalem. Donkeys in the day were used for civil ceremonies, not military ceremonies. All these actions taken together emphasize the humility of Jesus. They proclaim his true power. 
and more so manifest in the sacrifice that is to come. The power of the gospel is not political authority or military force. The prophetic message of Jesus is simple. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is human. Biblical scholar William Barclay put it like this. We may take it that Jesus' actions in this incident were planned and deliberate. He was following a method of awakening people's minds, which was deeply interwoven with the methods of the prophets. What we can glean from Palm Sunday is this lesson, is that both natures, humanity and divinity, are necessary for God to accomplish God's redemptive purposes. It certainly couldn't be just Jesus was a great teacher and he was fully, fully human and that's it. Or he was a divine figure and felt nothing, experienced nothing, didn't understand humanity. He was a divine figure. No, the, the two together come. That's why we have two candles on the altar. One represents the humanity of Jesus. Another represents the divinity of Jesus. The manner in which Jesus came into Jerusalem tells us of his courage, his claim, and his appeal to the heart by a demonstration of his humility. Again, Barclay puts it like this. He showed that he came not to destroy, but to love. Not to condemn, but to help. Not in the might of arms, but in the strength of love. Later in the week, at the table with the disciples, which we remember on Monday, Thursday, Jesus will announce in short, that what he came to do, he came to serve. And no better illustration of that is, hap no better, there is no better illustration of that than when Jesus, at that meal on Monday, Thursday, washed the disciples' feet. And he gave himself over to the Roman authorities. You know, we, we can't help it. We all take a heart and inspiration from, from, from leaders and, and persons who demonstrate power through acts of, of service and self-sacrifice. You know, they, they, they catch our attention. They, they grab us. You know, one, one such example is a doctor by the name of Art Van Zee. whom Beth Macy introduces in a book she wrote called uh, Dope Sick. I haven't read the book, but after reading about the book, I, I want to read more. But I, I, I got this illustration in connection with humility because it depicts Dr. Art Van Zee. It's about the opioid crisis. Dr. Van Zee trained at Vanderbilt Medical School and, have, could have, and could have practiced medicine in any number of wealthier settings. As the old saying goes, he could, have, he could have written his ticket. But he chose to serve in St. Charles, Virginia, population 159, deep in the corners of Lee County. Anybody here ever been to St. Charles? You got to want to go there. I've been to St. Charles. You, you don't drive on the road in Lee County and go, oh my, we have wound up in St. Charles. No, 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 no. You have to deliberately plan to go there because there, there, there's one road in 
and it's the same road out, that is St. Charles. It's there that Dr. Van Z has worked 16-hour days rising at 4 a.m. to complete necessary paperwork before meeting with patients. He was one of the first medical providers to sound the alarm about the addictiveness of opioids. That's a subject we're all too familiar with these days. And he brought it to the attention of Purdue Pharmaceuticals. And in doing so, he was ignored. As patient after patient died after drug overdoses. He has fought tirelessly to save patients from themselves and their addictions. As the publication of the book took place in late 2018, Dr. Van Zee was still at work serving hundreds of opioid use addicted patients as well as the surviving family members of the victims of that crisis. And this, he, this is what he said. He said his greatest fear was being hit by an intoxicated driver while jogging on the winding roads. Not because he feared his own death, but because where then would his patients go to get care? Jesus did not fear death. He approached death ultimately to conquer it. He did it, and Dr. Van Zee follows Jesus' example with the purpose to save other folks from themselves. You, you like those kind of stories? I do. Here's another. Pastor Joanna Adams describes a young man in her congregation that she served. He was a rising advertising executive who spent his Tuesday nights serving in the foot clinic for the church's homeless shelter. How many want to go to the foot clinic? for a homeless shelter. Anybody? Anybody? When asked why he chose to be there, he responded, he said, well, I figure I have a better chance of running into Jesus here than most places. That's all. We run into Jesus you and me, we run into Jesus when we put aside our own lives, our own power, and even our own privilege for a time and serve as Jesus served, seeking to follow his example. Another story, and it's one yet to be crafted. It's, it's the story of us. How will we be in going forward? How are we going to be as a family of God living as a people of the empty tomb? We, we still have a, a, a good week to think about it as we enter Holy Week because Easter's next Sunday. Gil Rendell, who is a pastor and a thinker, wrote a book, one, the one that I have had the privilege to, to read, uh, called Quietly Courageous. And, and in that book, he makes some compelling points. He says, talking about the you know, church going forward and, and uh, uh, moving ahead, and he wrote it way before there was ever the thought of a pandemic, or the concerns of a pandemic, but... My, the lessons that are in that book really do apply for this time now and going forward. He said, Too often, leaders and clergy 
feel like they're running in place without really getting anywhere. No, no, no hands necessarily. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Anybody ever felt that way? Huh? I mean, surely to goodness, you've never felt that way in church, have you? He says that too often there are two missions going on in the church. The public mission, what the institution says it does, but then there's the private mission, the operative goals. It is efforts to satisfy the interest of the strong coalition within that institution. We speak the public mission of reaching out and welcoming to introduce new people and the community. But often, it is about satisfying members already involved in the church. And sometimes that overrides attempts to redirect, to redirect the attention and the resources Because that redirection diminishes satisfaction. It's a struggle. Often, what is needed to fulfill the mission will not make the masses pleased or excited. I have yet, this is my, my 25th year as a pastor, I have yet, in 25 years, anybody, nobody has run up to me and said, ooh, 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 Reverend Bennington, can we do something new, different, uncomfortable, and shifting in all the things that I expect and feel good about? No one has said that. Another point that he makes is that leadership and change will require a new way of thinking and behaving. It takes courage to make people purposefully uncomfortable, is what he says. Hear that. It takes courage to make people purposefully uncomfortable. Not for the sake of being conflictual or cavalier or opinionated, but purposeful. Seeking to authentically follow Jesus. Today's leadership rests more on being and learning than on correctly doing. That quiet courage that's required of of clergy and leaders and people in, in a family of God will be necessary to say what needs to be said and walk with folks. Walk together in the change that is coming and in many cases needs to come. All of it's not about The change that's coming, it's, it's not about structure, but it's about purpose. The, the change that we deal with is that we right size and right align so we can be about the mission. It, it's not about form as much as it is about function. It, it's not about completing projects. It's about impacting people. It's about making a difference in our community that is tangible, noticeable, it points to God. We say that, and, and I say that, and, and you agree with me, and you say that to me, is that our mission? I agree with you. But then it takes that quiet courage for us to genuinely, truly, We model and do all that we do after the example of Jesus. And one characteristic 
of Jesus that we seek to mirror is humility. The references in the New Testament regard humility as, as a trait, especially in, um, in, in the early Christian life. I mean, that, that, was, that, was, uh, that was an indicator that you genuinely followed Jesus. You had humility. It was, one, it was the way that one would interact with the community. Humility does away with uh, selfish pride and arrogance and seeks the possibility of peace within the community, within a community of faith. We model the humility of Jesus whenever we sacrifice part of our own privilege and our power, whatever that might be, to serve others who are in need. If I've said a few things this morning that make you feel uncomfortable, I'm going to say this in love. I'm not sorry. If you feel like toes have been stepped on, let's sit down and talk because my toes are stepped on too. They hurt a lot. So we need to ask ourselves, how's it going to be uh, moving ahead in, in the Holy Week, in, embracing Easter, uh, post-Easter, the next several months, the next several years? How's it going to be? Uh, church will emerge anew in post-Easter, post-COVID days. I mean, it, it's happening now. You, you heard, uh, didn't share about how we're, we're getting the cameras and the technology up. I mean, that, that's brand new. That's brand new for a lot of churches. Um, and, and changes of that nature, how we direct our energy and our resources, that, that's a focus that's going to be there for many years to come. So how will we be? How will we align? How will we do? How will we structure? Will we take to heart function over form? Answers to those questions are yet to come. But I'm convinced of this, without a doubt, that all the answers, in whatever form they take, all of them will reflect the humility of Jesus. Let's pray. Help us, O oh God, and guide us, O oh God, to see in Jesus humility to model, humility to follow, humility for the living and the doing and the being in these days. So that we may be the family of God. And be quietly courageous in our going forward to serve and love you. In your name and for the sake of your son we pray. Amen. On the edge of the city, the crowd is waiting for the one who had been promised long ago. See the rider on a beast of burden, who is this man coming down a road? Voices are rising, branches waving in the air. Jerusalem makes a mighty noise. Shout for joy. He's 
the Messiah, Lord of heaven and earth, and he's coming now to reign upon his throne. He's the Messiah. Praise the living word, sing Hosanna, and let his name be known, Messiah. Above the horizon, the clouds are parting. A new age dawns, a promised one appears. See the rider on a white horse mounted. The final triumph of the king is near. Voices are rising, trumpets echo in the sky, heaven makes some mighty noise, shout for joy, he's the Messiah, Lord of heaven and earth, and he's coming now to reign upon his throne. He's a Messiah. Praise the living word. Sing Hosanna and let his name be known. He's a Messiah. Lord of heaven and earth. And he's coming now to reign upon his throne. He's the Messiah. Praise the living word. Sing Hosanna and let his name be known. Messiah. One of the privileges that I have being a pastor is to welcome people into membership. And so this morning, we are going to welcome uh, Debbie Grossclose Gallahan into membership. She is the sister of Susan Austin and uh, has been attending here. And well, we're going to welcome her into membership. Let's watch the clip. Thank you, Jim. It was a great song. Friends, wait till Susan Tom get here. Friends, one of the great privileges I have in being pastor is to welcome people into membership in church. And this morning, uh, Debbie Grossclose Galhan is coming to unite formally with First United Methodist Church uh, in membership. And so we want to welcome her and uh, receive her. She's been a part of this community for a while and has taken part in a lot of the things here. And so we want to, you know, officially welcome you and embrace you and say, so glad that you're a part of this uh, church family. You're choosing to plant yourself here. Uh, now, I'm going to ask Debbie some of the membership questions we ask everybody. Uh, so we uh, have a time of affirming and, and, and uh, affirming our faith together, but also affirming your faith as you join this community. So I will ask you these questions now. Uh, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, 
Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Yes. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you be loyal to Christ in the United Methodist Church through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Welcome, Debbie. Welcome, Mom. Do an elbow there and say welcome. Uh, so glad Tom and Susan are standing with you in support. And I want to encourage all of you to welcome Debbie, to, to call her, to to email, to reach out to her, to when you see her at the grocery store or wherever, to say welcome. So glad that you're part of, of Marion FUMC. And again, a heartfelt welcome and glad you are a part of the family. God bless. Let us stand. Remember the, the kits that are available for Monday, Thursday uh, to participate virtually, as well as the palm, palm fronds. So please uh, decorate the cross outside uh, for this Palm Sunday. Friends, let us go forward from this place, knowing that on this day, on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to begin the week of weeks, the, the events that would change all of life, creation, and the world forever. And he is Lord, he is King, he is human, he is Jesus. So let us go forward in the humility of Jesus to serve God and love neighbor. Go in peace. In the name of God, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>